pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see many old friends as well as a few new ones, or new ones, I hope. Thanks very much to Christina, to Matthew, to Jill, to Bianca, to Gregory, and everyone else at the De Young who has brought this splendid event together. Today, I want to focus on what quintessential elements contribute to making Navajo weaving a very identifiable art form. I'm going to focus on the 19th century, but it's going to bring commentary from the 20th and 21st centuries into play as well, and it will lead us principally to a discussion about process and product, which has been a theme underlying a number of people's talks already this morning, um, that notion of aesthetics and technique, process and product for me in Navajo weaving. I want to fill your eyes with beautiful 19th century blankets, classic period imagery, but I want to emphasize the technical processes behind that beauty, the importance of the weaver's own thoughts and ideas as they sit at the loom for many, many, many long hours. I dedicate this talk to the weavers indeed, past and present, and most especially to those like Sadie Curtis, someone that we lost in just this past year. Navajos have excelled at weaving since at least the mid 17th century with an earlier Puebloan tradition that dates back over 2,000 years. Navajo narratives relate their earliest weaving to endeavors by Spider-Man, who brought the first loom, built the first loom, and the first tools, and to Spider-Woman, who did the first weavings. The first loom was an object of great beauty and potential, and they continue to be very much the same, great beauty and potential. Um, the first loom's el uh, parts, its elements, were those of the natural universe. Zigzag lightning for the tension cord at the top of the loom. Warps of sun rays. Tools of precious materials. These essential elements maintain significance for many Navajo weavers today. And they form the first principles by which Navajo canon that I'm going to produce, pre present, um, tools as part of what contributes harmony and balance and continuity to Navajo weaving. Indeed, throughout the 20th century, looms and hand tools hold as much significance for weavers as any of the designs they might apply to their warps. In fact, the designs are often borrowed, adapted, invented, but it's the tools and techniques that have been passed down for generations. It's those tools that really captivate and energize weaving more than the designs. Even when looms are portable and displayed in quite secular settings, as you see here at the Museum of Natural History in Lincoln, Nebraska, they retain certain attributes as they tie them to tradition, as you see with Melissa's zigzag cords here. And it's true that even as Navajo woven designs from the 19th century are borrowed by others in Mexico, in Ukraine, in Turkey, around the world, um, it is the techniques and the processes that went into the textiles that really represents Navajo weaving. You can copy the design, but you can't do the, the construction in the, quite the same way. I want, this is a rather heavy chart, but I want to briefly introduce the time frame that I'm focusing on today. And from this point on, I'll be talking pretty exclusively about 19th century Navajo and Pueblo materials. This chart, by the way, will soon be available on Arizona State Museum's website, along with a database that we're publishing in the next two months, and I'll mention that in a minute. But this kind of chart, which continues on to the present, um, will be on that website as well. The earliest periods, of course, are known from archaeological records and also from Spanish documentation. The 1800s are a real time of foment in the American Southwest, first as Mexico gained control over Spain, and then as the US wrested control from Mexico in relatively swift succession. With the Santa Fe Trail opening, increased tensions between the South, in the Southwest between Indians and newcomers. Uh, resulted in Kit Carson and his troops being called in to forcibly move the Navajos from their homelands in the Four Corners area, and particularly around Canyon de Chez, which you saw earlier, um, to Fort Sumner, and the Navajos took the long walk there and eventually back. 
This was time that was tremendously destructive to families, um, to their livelihoods with the sheep, to their uh, ties with their homeland, and yet it also was a time of great exposure to new materials, new ideas, and especially to uh, a new market. Um, the military presence represents a huge uh, underlying presence that, that contributed to the collecting today. And as we've all mentioned, these collections that now form the canon of the work that we're studying, um, it is largely collections made by military soldiers in the 1860s through 80s um, that represent many of the pieces I'll be showing you in just a minute. Now from detailed analysis of collections, uh, we know that Pueblo and Navajo weaving share many common traits. The earliest historic Navajo weaving resembles Pueblo work quite closely. Pueblo weavers were working on an upright loom, which is continued today in Navajo tradition. They were weaving principally wider than long things. Most of my photos will present to you textiles as they were woven on the loom. And so the pieces on your right there are both wider than long as they were woven. And this is a format that is picked up by the Navajo weavers as well. Um, note, however, that the patterning in all three of these pieces, in the lower right you have a twill woven loom controlled pattern in a plaid. In the upper right you have embroidery on a twill weave. And in the left you do have plain weave, weft faced um, weave for banding. Uh, but it is the less notable of the Pueblo tradition that carries into the Navajo. So there are um, Navajo pieces that we'll look at that carry some of this tradition on, but quite rapidly, significant differences were developed by Navajo weavers to distinguish themselves from the Pueblo weavers and allow us to identify a really quite different <coughs> canon today. Now I'm able to talk about some of these issues in large part because of the decades long project by my mentor, Joe Ben Wheat, who sought out more than 1,500 textiles in public collections that had documented history. Let me say that again. He traveled and looked at over 50 museums collections and assembled 1,500 documented textiles from those. It's a bit like Sylvester's reporting on the discovery of an African canon and looking at those pieces um, seriously. In this case, uh, there are many undocumented pieces in museum collections as well as in private hands. Uh, it's looking for those that had the archival history, either of collection or making or subsequent provenance. He compiled, as you can see from that analysis form, quite a bit of information about each. He was an archaeologist by training, digging, analyzing prehistoric sites in the uh, Four Corners area, also in the high plains of Colorado and in West Texas. He worked in the Sudan near the Aswan Dam site. He was used to working systematically through a problem, gathering data, manually assessing it. His method for Navajo textiles was tr to triangulate from the textiles themselves and his detailed analysis and subsequent dye tests that he also did, had done, from those to the archival records to um, the chemical tests. As he accumulated information about the yarns, the dyes, the designs, he corrected many misconceptions that had been in the pub uh, published record. Now my own research, in addition to working with Joe on his historic studies and then compiling his posthumously published book and now publishing a revised database of his um, 1500 textiles with all of their records, my own work actually focuses on modern weavers and their perspectives. I'm an anthropologist who studies artists. Research by both of us points to a canon of process among Navajo weavers. Putting aside one very important point, which is that weaving does indeed yield products for trade and for the livelihood and support of many Navajo families, but putting that aside, the way Navajo weavers themselves talk to me about it and the way we see it in the historic record, process is far more important than product. And I liked Ruth's comments about the aesthetic and technical 
um, studies bringing social context to things. This, this is very much my point here, too. So these are very important physical traits that reflect process and that'll allow us to identify blankets of the 19th century as being Pueblo, or excuse me, as being Navajo. <laughs> Um, not Pueblo, not Mexican, not South American, um, but indeed, and not Spanish American, um, and, and not anything else. Some traits are shared, as the upright loom and the traditional hand tools are. Hand spun yarns are, of course, used by many, many traditions in the Southwest and elsewhere, but Navajo's use of the raveled and the mill spun yarns is exceptional. When Navajos picked up weaving from the Pueblos, they really didn't find a tradition of tapestry weaving among Pueblo and uh, earlier uh, textiles in the Southwest. This is something that they brought to it. The tapestry weave that allowed for so much variation in geometric as well as pictorial designs and a dense weft-faced fabric. The four selvages that are fixed in the loom is common to any backstrap or upright loom tradition. But Navajos worked with that as a frame in a very interesting way, as we'll see in a few minutes. And they framed it with these twined selvage cords along the edges and finished them with tassels in particular ways. And finally, for my list here for you, um, Navajos used what is called a lazy line, anything but lazy. And we'll look at those in a few minutes also. You'll, you'll be able to see what I mean with those. So here, just briefly, um, we see this incredible hand-spun churro sheep's wool in the foundation warps of a Navajo blanket, the, the, the underpinnings of the weaving itself. We see the churro sheep themselves who contributed the natural browns and white weft yarns as you see here, and then also the natural white and the indigo dyed hand-spun churro sheep's wool. Now, in addition to those homespun materials, cloth was imported quite early into the Southwest from Europe, from Turkey, from Mexico, and eventually from New England and from parts east in the United States. It was shipped to the Southwest in bolts of fabric, and we know this because of all kinds of travel uh, trade records. Navajo weavers obtained it through uh, passing traders, but principally through the military annuities that they were issued in the mid-1800s, and then again later from traders. Navajo women unraveled that yarn from the fabric and rewove it into their own blankets. Now it's the record of the original wools used, the original kinds of spinning that went into those yarns, the kinds of dyes that were used, which were principally insect dyes, cochineal and lac, all done far, far from the Southwest, but indelibly melded with those yarns. So that when Navajo weavers unraveled and inserted them into their own blankets, they gave us almost a diagnostic timeline for when those pieces were used. This is material known as bays in English, broadly speaking, and bayeta in Spanish. Now, there are many yarns that we've analyzed in these textiles um, and had dye tests with. Some are indeed raveled, and we call them bayeta. Others are commercial plied yarns, and you've heard the terms Saxony or Germantown or sometimes Zephyr yarns. And it's because of these decade-by-decade -decade changes in the industrial practices and also in the trade patterns um, that they now are the fingerprints in Navajo weaving for both identification and dating. There are details about this in Joe Ben Wheat's book, Blanket Weaving in the Southwest, which was published in 2003. And it will also be online when we publish our database. Now, I apologize for the darkness of this slide. When we previewed, I realized it was going to be very dark. Looking at whole cloth, Navajos use that four complete selvage system similar to the Pueblos. They weave wider than long, similar to the Pueblos, but they inserted a diagonal line very subtly into various parts of their weaving in order to reach from right to left. And here, another dark slide, you can see some of that almost what would in Oriental carpet tradition be called abrash, um, the change in color from one portion to another. This is a technique that allowed a weaver to reach or focus on one area of her piece move over, focus on another piece, and not create a slit in the middle, but rather create a, 
a diagonal that she could weave on top of. It allowed for concentration in specific design areas, but it also simply allowed, in this case, for um, a very elegant um, solution to a wide piece. Those lazy lines do not appear in most Pueblo textiles. You find them in a piece that looks Puebloid. You can possibly think it might be Zuni, but almost certainly it would be Navajo. Interestingly, we looked at a, a, a 18th century tapestry and collections here just a few minutes ago, European tapestry, and the French used lazy lines. They used them to great effect for um, both design enhancement, but also sort of as expansion joints and as a bridge would be. They, they allow the weaver to not provide too much tension in the fabric. So um, Navajos emphasized tapestry weave, as I'd mentioned before, and color changes more than Pueblo weavers ever did. Early designs are almost entirely composed of small stepped or terraced elements, as you see here. And these derive from Navajo basketry patterns as much as anything else in the earlier record that we know. There are no smooth or jagged diagonal lines that appear. They're all tiny little steps, and you'll see this over and over. So now I'm moving from the, the canon of technique, that tapestry weave, to the canon of design, the aesthetic canon um, by which Navajos also operate. Although I will say that this now begins to be an art historical approach, an anthropological outsider's approach to the design. Um, we're going to see each of these elements um, as I show you textiles, so I'm going to go through them very, very quickly. But here are the stepped elements I just mentioned. In Navajo weaving, there's an emphasis on centers and ends and corners. You'll see in other traditions radically different formatting. Navajos in the 19th century, by and large, avoided borders in their rugs, even when they were working within that four selvage, selvage frame. Their designs, ironically, repeat beyond the boundaries. If you look at Navajo design, as we will in a minute, you'll see that those designs could go on and on. They are not framed like the technique is framing them. And oftentimes, they present us with optical illusions, a three-dimensional kind of look, a, a compressed design, a foreground and a background. Um, Navajo weavers talk a great deal about contrast in their work and placing contrasting colors against each other, not using the muted colors that Pueblo weavers do. And I have to say that there is indeed variability among the canon as well. I'm not st speaking about every single piece. But I'm starting with some very simple pieces, and you can already see that in this simple banded blanket, there is an emphasis on the center. The designs continue beyond the boundaries. If you look at Navajo, Pueblo, and Spanish American banded blankets, the top is a very straightforward Pueblo piece. The one on the right is Navajo with an emphasis on the center. And the one in the lower left is Spanish American with much more complex zone banding within each of those bands. If we move to look at some of the women's garments, both the mantas that were wrapped around shoulders or under one arm and over one shoulder as a dress, and then the two-piece dresses, we see tapestry beginning to come to the fore. We see the end panels becoming dominant. And here are just a sampling of some of the other classic patterns that appear in Navajo women's dresses. If we talk about chief's blankets, we begin to really see the elements that I've just mentioned uh, to you. We see chief's blankets, uh, a misnomer in Navajo uh, culture. Uh, chief's were not the principal form of governance for Navajo, small family groups settled over the large landscape, but Navajo blankets were traded out into the plains where there were indeed Indian chiefs um, who acquired these pieces and, and wore them with prominence and actually gave them to the women in the tribe to wear with prominence as well. So in the upper right you see a chief's blanket in a, a hopefully very familiar format to many of you. In the lower right, is a, what's called a woman's style blanket, um, similar to the chief's, but with those bold black and white horizontal stripes beginning to be more muted and, and narrow in format. Um, both are, are very canonical forms in Navajo uh, repertoire. I'm going to show you a whole series and how it evolved through time. There were these very simple banded blankets, again, emphasis on the center, um, alternating indigo blue and 
natural brown-black wool, or with the addition of red added, but still all in horizontal banding. You would be sure you can find many lazy lines in these very wide pieces that a weaver would have to weave in segments across. Quite striking pieces that would be folded around the, the neckline and wrapped around the body. Uh, I should say that we see these pieces dating anywhere from 1800 to 1850 by and large with reproductions ensuing in, in years after that. But right around 1840 or so we begin to see that the banding is segmented into these rectangles into what we call a nine spot pattern sometimes or a 12 spot pattern. Um, the introduction of more trade yarns, uh, uh, raveled or commercially plied, a second phase blanket, as we would call this. That begins to morph by the 1850s, uh, 60s into a third phase pattern where those rectangles begin to look like diamonds and triangles. You can imagine that if this blanket is folded around the body, those patterns uh, match beautifully and, and make quite the stunning garment. Um, this is a very classic third phase piece, and I should tell you that all of these pieces, as I say, that I'm dating them or calling them classic, the designs are certainly what I see, what you see on the screen, but it's the materials and the textures and the techniques that really allow me to date them. This design um, is prominent in the mid-1800s, continuing into the 1870s, and by the 1880s we see those front diamonds coalescing. We begin to see this optical illusion, this compression of design, creating a foreground with the black and white moving to the background. And then the coup de résistance for this kind of technique is where you almost lost those black and white. Um, a marvelous uh, trope for a weaver to use. There are longer than wide textiles woven in the Navajo tradition that are not Spanish influence, that may have been part of the Pueblo Navajo dialogue. We call these sarapes, after the Mexican term for a Navajo wearing blanket, but they would have been turned sideways and worn around the shoulders in much the similar way as those chief's blankets I just showed you. I like to show this blanket because it's one of the absolutely rare and exceptional pieces that has early hand-spun cotton, all of that white weft is hand-spun cotton. Uh, Navajo weavers adopted the Puebloan-grown cotton, but rapidly acquired the Spanish wool, which came into the Southwest in 1598 with Don Juan de Oñate. So they had wool very early on to incorporate. But in this case, not only the hand-spun wool and uh, hand-spun cotton, but raveled reds, which allow us to date this piece to the early first half of the 19th century. Other sarape patterns for the 19th century um, are marked by an overall network of design, by those stepped and terraced motifs that came off of the basketry, um, moving into a very elaborate scheme, still with some emphasis towards the center and the corners, um, a very simple palette. Many people tend to think that earliest Navajo blankets were natural dyed in the Southwest with yellows and greens. This is not true. The earliest palette is the native white with indigo, blue, and the red from raveled fabrics or later commercial yarns. Um, it's only after 1870s that we begin to see a, pre a, a strong addition of yellows and greens um, in the Navajo repertoire. This is a wonderful anomaly I love to introduce people to because it is indeed bordered, and I thought Hedlund said there weren't bordered rugs, um, bordered blankets. Um, this was collected sometime between 1861 and 1863 by Mary Loud Gay, and um, is, uh, has three-ply Saxony yarns with full cochineal dye. We know this piece dates to when her family said she collected it. Um, and indeed, Navajos occasionally did experiment. They stretched the, the cannons. So here we have a marvelous example of stretching, stretching the cannon. Um, ponchos are another format uh, for Navajo weaving. We find that the designs follow very much the same format as the sarapes, but they do have a neck slit woven in, sometimes very obviously functional, sometimes a little too small to be used but brilliant in these overall networks with those stepped basket patterns that are the marker of this mid-1800 period. <laughs> 
The final group I'm going to talk about are Moki stripes um, with this alternating blue and black an overlay of other kinds of patterns and a playing of that three-dimensional quality as you saw before. And then towards the end of this classic period, 1870s, we begin to see a number of pieces that have a mark of Spanish as well as um, Pueblo traits. And we begin to think, and we begin to know, um, that there are Navajo slaves living in Spanish households, servants, um, people who become family members as well. And the hybrid qualities of these blankets are a fascination, a marvelous thing to look at. In the late Last quarter of the 1800s, we see introduction of more design, more patterning. We're losing the qualities of the classic period that I've been speaking about principally. Uh, even further in time, 1880s, 1890s, we begin to see influence from Saltillo Sarapes with the zigzag lines, with the vertical orientation. We're losing that network feel. We're losing the basketry. And then it's a good time to close, I think, by showing you um, that the classic canon, while it died out for a time in the late 19th century, early 20th century, contemporary Navajo weavers are paying attention to it. They are spending time with curators like me and others in collections going through the materials. Mary Lou Schultz here um, raises churro sheep. She dyed the wool with indigo dye, and she dyed that yarn with cochineal herself. She did not unravel that yarn. So here is a contemporary Navajo weaver um, very much one who styles herself as an artist, looking also at the garment tradition, not just the wall-hung art tradition, retaining the techniques and retaining the, the aesthetic canon. To close, finally, I'd like to show you Tanaba Natani's shawl, in which she retains the tools and the loom, but indeed has her own interpretation of the design, going back to Spider Woman, Grandma Spider, and that technique. Thanks very much.